So with that, let's get into the Word of God. On Sunday mornings, we're now going through Ephesians, having completed Galatians chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And our text today is going to be chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. So I'll have you turn there if you're not there already. And if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, that's all right. Beginning in verse 3, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is writing to the church in Ephesus and says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, verse 11, we were also chosen, having been, and here it is again, (laughs) predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who, verse 14, is a deposit, an earnest money deposit, if you will, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Wow. Wow. Let's close in prayer. Just wow. (laughs) Let's pray. We won't close, but we'll pray. Father in heaven, how grand and glorious is your word, O God. Lord, we thank you. And even saying that or praying that seems wholly inadequate in expressing that which is inexpressible. Our thanks to you, our praise to you, our gratitude to you for all that you've blessed us with. Even now, Lord, as we have this time together in your word, would you, as you're always so faithful to, and as only you can, by the Holy Spirit, just minister to us and speak into our lives in and through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So I'm going to have to maybe explain a little bit the title that I've chosen for today's teaching. You see it there on the screen. Um, The title that I chose is, God Really Likes Me. How's that? Now, I chose this title because we live in a day and age where sadly, the word love has been so cheapened so much so that it almost 
in some ways has less of an impact than does the word like. Let me illustrate. Let's just say that I instead chose for today the title of God Loves Me. Oh, of course, God is love. Sure, he loves me. What's for lunch? Right? I mean, it's a firm grasp of the obvious, to say the least. Of course, God loves me. But when you say, actually, God really likes you. He does? You mean, God's not mad at me? No. No, God's not mad at you. God took all of his anger, all of his wrath, and he put it on the person of Jesus Christ almost 2,000 years ago on that cross so that with Paul in Romans 8.1, we could say there is therefore now no condemnation, no anger, no wrath for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, why is this so crucial, so vital, so important? And I want to answer that with just a personal testimony of what God did in my own life when I came to the realization that God's not angry at me as my Heavenly Father. It changed everything. It changed the whole complexion of my relationship with Him. See, if God isn't mad at me, then I'm going to want to draw closer to Him. Because conversely, if God's mad at me, I'm going to instead want to keep my distance from Him. Like many, like many of you perhaps, we tend to view our relationship with our Heavenly Father through the lens of our relationship with our earthly Father. And I know for me that I did not have a great relationship with my earthly Father. He was always angry at me. I mean, like, all the time. And <laughs> probably rightfully so. But... Um, we didn't have a good relationship because of it, and I would find myself wanting to keep my distance from him, so in the mornings I would try to avoid him and wait to get up and go about my day until after he had left the house. And then when evening time came, I would also try to do the same, and I would try to um, go to bed before he got home just to avoid his wrath, his anger, his yelling. And one of the hardest things for me in my own relationship with the Lord to come to the place of and realize was that um, my Heavenly Father is never mad at me. He, he does love me so much, but not only does he love me, he, he really likes me. And how about this? He wants to be around me. And that makes me want to be around him. He wants to spend time with me. And so too does that make me want to spend time with him. And so that's how it just changed the, the complete relational dynamic in my life. And the reason I share that is because the text that is before us today speaks to this relationship that we can have with God. And it's interesting because it's almost like the Apostle Paul is giddy in writing about how God has blessed us, how much, God, how abundantly God has blessed us. I say giddy for this reason. Beginning in verse 3, 
all the way through verse, uh, verse 14 is actually one long sentence. Uh, I hope you understand that uh, in the original manuscripts, there was no punctuation, there was no chapter breaks, there were no verses. That didn't come till later, uh, starting with the Geneva Bible and then subsequently the uh, King James Bible. But this was uh, just one long running letter, no chapters, no verses, and no punctuation. So it's almost like Paul um, takes the pen, he actually has someone write this for him, and he just can't stop as he lists all of these blessings that are ours in Christ. There's no sentence structure, he doesn't care. He just keeps going. And by the way, uh, this is the longest sentence in the entirety of Scripture right here from verses 4 or verse 3 all the way through to verse 14. One went as far as likening this to an opera, which has an overture in the sense that it sets the tone for all the melodies that will yet follow. There is a melodic uh, tone to what Paul writes here. In verses three through six, we have the first stanza of sorts with Paul writing about the blessings that are ours from the Father. In verses seven through 12, it's about all that is ours through God the Son And verses 13 through 14, it's all about what's ours by God, the Holy Spirit. All of these blessings. And when you read through this, you can't help but notice (laughs) that it's as if Paul is making this incredible and almost unbelievable claim. I mean, when you... At first read, maybe it doesn't come leaping off the pages of your Bible. But when you read through this, and you really allow the Holy Spirit to minister this to you, it is, dare I say, outlandish, for lack of a better word. I mean, this is unbelievable. This is incredible. I mean, just go down and you'll forgive my way of saying this, grocery list, all of the blessings that are here. In fact, you know what? Let's do it. You ready? In verse 4, and this is not exhaustive, by the way. In verse 4, He chose us. In verses 5 and 6, He predestines us. In verse 7, He forgives us and redeems us. In verse 8, He lavishes us. I love that. Go look up that word, the definition of just the word lavish. He spoils us. He lavishes us. In verses 9 and 10, He reveals His will to us. In verses 11 and 12, He conforms us. And how about this? In verses 13 and 14, He marks us. He puts the deposit down, guaranteeing us and seals us with the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our rich inheritance in Christ. Do you know what's in store for us? It would make the best of uh, trust funds pale in comparison to what awaits us in heaven. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no lip could utter, no mouth could speak. It would be criminal to even try to describe that which we only see through a glass dimly, blurry, if you prefer now. But when that time comes, we have in store for us unspeakable riches. That's our inheritance. And it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. What seals the deal, if you will, is the Holy Spirit. That alone, right? That alone. Are you kidding me? That alone. What a blessing. 
Even the word blessing doesn't seem to quite begin to describe it. Charles Spurgeon had this to say. Our thanks are due to God for all the temporal blessings. Certainly God blesses us in the here and now, in the temporal as well as the eternal. But our thanks are due to God for all the temporal blessings. They are more than we deserve. But our thanks ought to go to God in thunders of hallelujahs for spiritual blessings. A new heart, listen, is better than a new coat. To feed on Christ is better than to have the best earthly food. To be an heir of God is better than being the heir of the greatest nobleman. To have God for our portion is blessed, infinitely more blessed than to own broad acres of land, even 3.1 acres on Kamehameha Highway in Kahalu. Just saying. God hath blessed us with spiritual blessings. These are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of all blessings. They are priceless in value. That's kind of an understatement, isn't it? Let me add that in my own personal experience, I don't really believe it is possible to fully enjoy the material blessings from God until you first received and enjoyed and appreciated the spiritual blessings from God. I mean, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses his own soul? What emptiness resides in merely the blessing of the here and the now, especially if it comes at the expense of the riches that await in heaven. Now, there's a question, and I'm going somewhere with this, and if you'll be patient with me, as I know you always are, you kind of have to be in some ways, but uh, the question is one of why. Why does God choose us? Why does God bless us? Why is God so lavish and extravagant with us? Why does God give us such riches that are priceless in value? Is there something about me that God just looks down and says, man, I really like that guy. I'm going to bless him. Don't raise your hand if <laughs> that is absolutely not the case. In fact, I would argue, at least in my own life, the opposite is the case. God looks down and says, oh, that guy needs my blessing. <laughs> Look at him. He's nothing without me, and certainly I am not. And neither are you, so don't look at me all pious and everything, all right? <laughs> no, seriously though, why? Why is God so lavish with us? And why does God bless us so? Answer? You ready for it? Wait for it. <laughs> Here it is. He likes us. He likes us. He loves us, but he actually likes us. That's why. He likes us, not because of anything in air within us. There's nothing innate within us that attracts us to him. No, it brings him great pleasure. And it's according to his will. And because of his love, he chooses to bless us. Now, here's where I'm going with this. We need this foundational understanding in order that we might deal with the elephant in the room. Oh, 
Some of you are going, there's an elephant in the room? Oh yeah, there's an elephant in the room. What's the elephant? Oh, it's the elephant of predestination. Yeah, sends shivers up and down the spine of some, just even uttering the word. Did you notice that Paul brings it up twice? Once in verse 5, once in verse 11. So it probably goes without saying, but this has been the subject of much debate and sadly much division within the body of Christ concerning God predestining us. The question is, how can God choose us? Let's put the blessings Leave them on the table, but just put them aside for the meantime. But let's just talk about God choosing us, but still at the same time giving us the free will to choose Him. How does that work? Wait a minute. If I'm predestined, that means that it's already been decided. So really, I have nothing to do with it. It's almost as if, if God has predestined me to be saved, I'm getting saved whether I like it or not. Am I right? Is that not what predestination in that context suggests? You're predestined. You're amongst the elect. Wait a minute. Wait, stop, stop. You can't say that. Because if you say that, then you have to alter the entirety of the pages of Holy Writ, starting with that most famous and well-known verse in John 3.16. And instead, it should have said, For God so loved the world, that whosoever is amongst the elect predestined that would believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, please. Um, hmm. This is another one of those things where the enemy will do something right now by way of a distraction because he doesn't want you to grasp the truth that is before us this morning. So please don't let your mind wander. I'll do my best on my part by the Holy Spirit to be as clear and concise and simple as I possibly can. Let me share with you what one commentator wrote. I think it's perfect. This is the answer to, one answer to the question of how can we still have the free will to choose if it's already been predetermined, if we're already predestined. Listen, it's as if when a person decides to choose the Lord, he walks through a door over which is written the words, whosoever will, let him come, Revelation 22, 17. Yet, The moment he walks through the door, he looks back and sees the words, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. John 15, 16. Does that help? Some of you are going, are you kidding me? That's... (laughs) I still don't understand how you can bring that together. I I still don't know how I choose if it's already been predetermined if I've already been predestined. Well, here's the thing. Uh, God chooses you after. I love what D.L. Moody humorously said. He said, I'm so glad God chose me before I was born because I don't think he would have chosen me after I have lived. (laughs) I think we can all say amen to that. Before we were formed in our mother's womb, he knew us, he predestined us. Remember now, important, God knows the end from the beginning. God exists outside of time. He dwells in eternity. He sees the beginning from the end. He sees you before you were born. He sees your life from front to finish before you even had life because he knows the end 
from the beginning. And he knows, think about this, he knows the choices you will make in your life before you make those choices in your life. So that comports with this issue of predestination. However, I think I would be grossly remiss if I didn't try to uh, explain, especially when it comes to what's known today as Calvinism, uh, five-point Calvinism. I won't, in the interest of time, go into the specifics of it, but let me at least explain what Calvinism and on the opposite side of the table, Arminianism is, starting with Calvinism. Calvinism is the belief that you can't be saved unless God has predestined you to be saved. That's just a, a real summary judgment, if you will, of Calvinism. Now, there's also Arminianism. Now, what Arminianism is, is the belief that it's man's free will when it comes to salvation, but they believe that one can potentially lose their salvation as well. So you almost have these two opposite ends of the spectrum with Calvinism on one side and Arminianism on the other. Um, I am keenly aware that the way I'm going to say this might seem blunt, but I need to summarily state that both Calvinism and Arminianism are not scriptural. They cannot be. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. There are some uh, well-respected Bible scholars, if you want to call them that, and pastors of very large churches uh, who believe in uh, Calvinism and the five points of what some call hardcore Calvinism. Uh, what are you saying? Oh, we'll see him in heaven. I, I, um, and I say this in love. <laughs> um, it's kind of like those who take issue with the pre-tribulation rapture, okay? Notice I never call it a theory, the, the pre-tribulation rapture theory. It is not a theory. It is a biblical truth, and it is a biblical fact. Now, there are those brothers and sisters in Christ who disagree, some of whom believe the rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation before the wrath of God, the sixth seal. Some believe in the post-tribulation rapture, which that one's um, hard for me to get my mind around. Uh, and some don't even believe in a rapture at all. Now, uh, Jesus didn't say, unless you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus did say in John's gospel, chapter 3, as it's recorded, is unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. So our belief in a pre-tribulation rapture is not a salvation issue. However, I think it is incumbent upon me to clear up this matter as it relates to Calvinism. Um, I want to recommend <clears throat> what I believe is, bar none, the best book that was ever written refuting Calvinism, and it's by the late Dave Hunt of the Berean Call. It's titled, interestingly, What Love Is This? I actually had the privilege of uh, spending the better part of a weekend with uh, Dave Hunt before he went home to be with the Lord. Uh, when I was in North Idaho, I had him speak. We rented out North Idaho College, and it was at the time that he was actually writing uh, the first edition uh, of this book. And we had some very interesting and fascinating uh, dialogue concerning it. And then once it was released, uh, he told me later, he said, I had no idea uh, the vitriol that I would uh, uh, be on the receiving end of and the attacks uh, from uh, many in the body of Christ that, I mean, resorted to, and this is always a telltale sign that you've already lost the argument is when you start name calling. <laughs> and I mean, they called him every name in the book. 
And so what did Dave do? Well, he came out with a second edition <laughs> and refuted all of those who were uh, bringing up their uh, uh, arguments which were to no avail. But if you're interested in knowing more about this, I would uh, really encourage you. It's subtitled, Calvinism's Misrepresentation of God. And it is a misrepresentation of God because what God is this? I mean, how, how cruel is this? You mean to tell me that this is a God of love who loves me, and you're telling me, Pastor, that he really likes me, yet there's a potential for me to have been born and predestined for hell? No, think about that. You, you, you cannot argue that Calvinism is scriptural without trying to insert that unscriptural falsehood. And that is, to me, the biggest problem with Calvinism. I want to share with you, very simply, the main problem with the belief that only those who are predestined to be saved can be saved. Hang on to the blessings. I want to come back to the blessings here in a moment. But here is the main problem with Calvinism. Calvinism presupposes that God also predestines those who are to be eternally damned. You can't say God has predestined you for salvation without also saying that God hasn't predestined you as well for eternity in hell. You can't, it, you, what's that saying? Which I have, no, I have no idea what it really means. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Maybe somebody after the service can explain to me after all of these years what that actually means. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Okay. Well, you, you, you can't just have it that way without it also being the other way. If I'm predestined to heaven, then that means I'm also predestined to hell. And that, my friend, is patently and demonstrably false. It is inconsistent with the character and the nature of a loving God. It's not that God has love. God is love. That's who He is. And if He is a God of love, and He is, there is no way that He would ever in that love, because of love, predestine somebody to an eternity in hell. It is impossible. Impossible, I say. Okay, I'll calm down. But here's another problem. Whether it's Calvinism or even Arminianism, it is predicated upon a finite reconciliation of that which is only reconcilable by and in the realm of the infinite. You cannot, this side of heaven, possibly fathom the infinite while in the finite. You cannot reconcile predestination with man's free will to choose this side of heaven. It won't happen. Try as you may. And many very well-intentioned scholars have attempted to do so, but in the finite, you'll always fall short. It's only in the infinite that this issue of reconciling the two will be a non-issue once and for all. And I love that. I love what John says. In heaven, we're going to know no man after the flesh. You know how a lot of us humorously say, man, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God thus and such. No, you're not. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're, you're, when you get there, you're going to be like, you know, <laughs> you know you've heard the, th the three responses when we get to heaven. The first response is, <gasps> You're going to be like that for the first, you know, millennia. Just <laughs> the second response is, huh? they're here? I'll let you think about that one just for a moment. 
Even now, people are coming to mind as I said it. But here's the third one. Where are they? Oh. Listen, we're going to be on our face, casting our crowns before him at the throne, praising him with all of our might and for all eternity. There's not going to be any questions. Could you imagine? First of all, let's just, for purpose of discussion, let's just imagine a scenario when we get to heaven and there's a dialogue between us and our Calvinist, uh, Calvinist brothers and sisters. Oh, you're here, I see. Huh, boy, God's a gracious God. <laughs> Told you you were wrong. Oh, yeah? What about you? Okay, I'm just going to ask you straight up. Is that heaven? That's not heaven to me. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> that sounds like the other place, actually, to me. Nobody's going to be. Oh, there's, there's pre, pre-trib Tim. <laughs> there's uh, post-trib Tom. <laughs> None of that. It is a non-issue. Let me say it this way. Hopefully this will help. See predestination as God's destiny for me without erasing my responsibility to choose. Let me take it a step further and draw your attention to stunning words from Jesus to the church in Sardis recorded in Revelation 3 verse 5. I think you'll see why here in a moment. Listen to what he says in the letter to the church in Sardis. He says this. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And, listen, I will not blot out, hang on to that, blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Did you catch that? Uh, the implication is, is that in order for a name to be blotted out, it has to have been there in the first place. I know, again, that's a firm grasp of the obvious, but stay with me, right? Uh, what do we know to be true? It's not God's will that any should perish. God did not create hell for man. God created hell for Satan and his demons. Never his will that any man should go there. And certainly God would never predestine that any man go to hell. As one aptly said it, Jesus hung on that cross as if to say, over my dead and resurrected body will you go to hell. And that's literal. And here's why I say that. And this is why it's so stunning. Everyone's name is already written in the book of life. That's God's will, that all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So he writes every name of every man, woman, and child ever born from Adam to the end in the book of life. It's a pretty big book. Now, what he says is um, the jury's out. I already know what the decision is going to be because I know the end from the beginning. Um, but the jury is out on while you're alive, and this brings up another question I want to uh, quickly uh, answer in just a moment concerning uh, after you die, do you get a second chance? Answer in a word, no. It is appointed unto man once to die, then the judgment. You either go to the great white throne judgment or you go to the Bema seat, which is like the Olympics judgment seat where the judges reward you. I... I'm not the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer, but I think I want to go to that one, the Bema seat, judgment of Christ, and not the great white throne judgment where I'm punished eternally. I'd rather be rewarded eternally. But see, when I, of my own volition, my own free will, choose to reject Jesus Christ, that's when my name is blotted out. But until and unless that happens, my name is still in there. That's consistent with the nature of a loving God. God will never predestine anybody to hell. Man chooses 
man chooses. The choice is ours. That's Romans 3, 5. Um, I want to close this way with uh, actually Romans 8, 28 through 30. <laughs> we all know Romans 8, 28. Um, but it's v- verse 29 particularly that I think fills in all the blanks and connects all the dots. But I want to say this. God has predestined us and chosen to bless us because he loves us and he even likes us too. Now listen through and view from that lens this famous passage here in Romans 8. Listen. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Okay? What's his purpose? Oh, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, because he knows the end from the beginning, he also predestined, because he knows the end from the beginning, to, here's the purpose, conform to the image of his son. Stop right there. That's the purpose. To which God works all things together for the good. Because ultimately, in the end, it fulfills and serves and is according to his purpose. What's his purpose? His purpose is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Simply put, to make us more like Jesus. All those trials in your life, all the difficulties in your life, all of the hardships in your life, all the problems in your life, God is using those to make you more like Jesus. Why? Because that is his ultimate purpose in allowing you to go through that difficulty that you're going through in your life. And that's how he works it out for the good. So that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then listen to verse 30 lastly. Moreover, and here's the word again, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Here's the bottom line with all the trials and difficulties and hardships and problems in your life, serving a purpose? Well, so too on the other side of that, do all the blessings in your life. Let's take those blessings, both here and now and that which awaits. All of those blessings in your life serve a purpose as well. And that's the why behind the what, if I can say it that way. If you leave here today with nothing else, or if you leave before or even during the prophecy update, you you get mad at me for something I said, that's fine. But leave with this one takeaway. God likes you. God is not mad at you. And God has chosen to bless you with unspeakable blessings, both here and also in eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I thank you. I thank you for the strength of this passage that we've looked at today. Now, Lord, we want for the Holy Spirit to take it from here. And begin that process as arduous as it might be for some. To apply it to our lives and bless it to our hearts. Especially for anybody here today that just brought this notion with them to church today. That somehow you're angry with them. Lord I pray that. This would change everything today. Lord, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.